All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from, and welcome to another edition of Spring Office Hours. I'm your host, Dan Vega. Alongside me every week is my good buddy, Deshaun Carter. How are you, my friend? I'm, I'm wonderful. Uh, it's been a great day already. Again, it's been a great day. Uh, we're here to share all the stuff that we've learned. There's so much coming down the pipe. Uh, it's just It's a great time to be a developer and even better for the Spring developers. Yeah, uh, very good time. Uh, we'll have some things to talk about. So we have a bunch of people joining us already, uh, which is really great to see. So if you're new to the show, I'll just give you a quick agenda. Uh, we'll take some time to look at the calendar and look at what's new in the world of spring. As far as releases go, we'll take a look at um, any blog posts or videos that surface that may be of interest to you. And then we'll go ahead and jump into today's topic, which is going to be spring to production. So it's not enough to just build an application. You need to get it out there in production for others to consume or use or take, you know, whatever you need to do with it, uh, you need to get it in production somehow. So we'll take a look at some options as well as go through uh, a demo or two. So with that, um, Deshaun, I saw you have been running a lot lately. Uh, I have been, I've been like trying to do 5k every, every day. Every day. Uh, I love I'm it. Signed up for the, uh, I was signed up for the Garmin marathon or the Kansas city marathon uh, here coming up this weekend. Uh, but now I'm just going to be doing the half. Uh, I'm going to take it easy and that'll give me time to get into my son's uh, football and soccer games. Uh, and I, I also noticed is. they had a six hour cutoff uh, and <laughs> I wasn't really going out there to like win any awards or, or set <laughs> yeah. any records. Uh, I was, I was excited to just go out and finish uh, so with all those things combined, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do the half. And this 5K every day was uh, inspired uh, by CTO advisor uh, Keith. And it's been it's been fun and it's doable. Yeah. So I'm, I'm enjoying yeah. it so far. It's a good way to kind of hold yourself accountable. So I've been in in the in the shadows quietly doing it every other day with you. But not every you day. <laughs> yep. um, the reason I bring that up is because you and I have been talking for anyone who's going to join us at spring one this year in San Francisco. Deshaun and I, um, you know, we've we've run together. We've been on the spring one tour, uh, you know, over this past year. And we, we've had some really good runs together. They're very relaxing. They're not like, hey, let's go out and run the fastest mile ever. It's just kind of get out and see the city. 
I think my my favorite run was in New York. We we got to run around Central Park. That was really cool. Um, so I think it, it in, kind of inspired Spring Run at Spring One. So yes. we're gonna try and get together a run. We don't know what day, what the route is, but we are gonna start working on that. So if you're a runner, if you're a walker, doesn't matter uh, what your speed is, um, what your you know activity level is. We're going to try and get everybody together for a little fitness at spring one. So that's, this is your chance to start, start getting those runs in now and get ready for spring one. Awesome. Uh, let me give a shout out to uh, Patrick Padgett. Uh, super awesome guy. I have known him for 23 ish years now. Uh, and yeah, he's awesome. Thanks for joining. It's great. There's a lot of uh, friendly faces and friendly names out here. Uh, so yeah, welcome to the stream and stay tuned to our channels. You can find uh, Dan on Twitter and our handles are there. Uh, so yeah, when that run comes, yeah, just make sure that you're getting the info and as soon as we know, we'll also show it and share it here. Yeah, that'll be great. All right, so we'll just jump into the show today. So we're gonna start the way we do every episode. We're gonna go ahead and jump over to the browser and we are going to look at the calendar. So if you don't know that this is available, this is calendar.spring.io. You can look at it in this nice calendar view. There's also a list view, but this gives you a glimpse into what releases are happening on what day. As you can see, the 11th is today. It's a little highlighted there. So we just run down what is happening this week. And as you can see between this week and next, a lot of things are happening. Uh, we are getting closer and closer to November, which means closer to Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. So a lot of releases are going to happen around that because a lot of things went into Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. And all of the projects in the Spring ecosystem had to do some things to, to make sure that they would fit alongside those releases. So that's why you'll see a lot of things kind of coming out in the next month uh, or so. So this week, um, I think highlighted there on Wednesday, tomorrow, Spring Framework 6 RC1. So we're off of milestone. We're off of, uh, you know, sometime a milestone three, four, five. We're actually on a release candidate that that's what that rc stands for so release candidate one for spring framework six six um really really interested in seeing that um <clears throat> anything else that kind of stands out to you deshaun i mean uh, obviously we we had on um uh, jonathan a couple weeks ago and we talked about observability bunch of micrometer releases uh went out yesterday and today i believe i saw a couple things so uh, a lot of things around observability. If you're new to observability and what observability really means, uh, go ahead and check out our show from two weeks ago with Jonathan. Uh, he kind of walked through the kind of three great. pillars yeah. of observability. Yeah, I learned a lot. And great um, demo too. Yeah, so that was really good. So if you're you're interested in that stuff, go 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 check that out. Um, and then yeah, uh, some reactor stuff. Uh, we have Spring Retry, Spring Batch, uh, Spring Data. A bunch of a couple of releases there. Spring Data release. Um, so those are exciting. And Spring LDAP. So since we have a lot more people that are kind of new to the show, today's our first time streaming on the Spring Developer Channel. Uh, we also stream on a bunch of other channels. But one of the things that we learned and realized early is that if you're using Spring, uh, somebody should be paying attention to what's coming down the pipe. And that's what we want to do here. We're, we're kind of showing like, hey, here's the things to be ready for. Here's the things you should be looking ahead to so that you're not caught off guard. Uh, somebody should be reading the release notes. Somebody should be uh, understanding what's being deprecated uh, and what's added uh, with the new features. So we're trying to use this as a reminder uh, that it's always changing. It's always growing. And that's one of the benefits of using uh, something like Spring Boot is with our initializer, we're making sure that all of those releases are tied together and they all work together. And that's one of the other benefits you get from the Spring ecosystem. So we want you to be aware of what's coming down the pipe and we want you to see, uh, yeah, what you get to look forward to. I am a, am enjoying uh, evaluating the release candidates and taking my old projects and upgrading them to the new versions uh, and seeing what I run into. Uh, and I can share that I've, I've run into a couple of sticky points uh, where I'm having to do a lot more Gradle 
than Maven. Maven is my default, but now I'm using Gradle more because Gradle is doing some things today uh, that the release candidates will do with Maven later. So just one of those things that uh, I'm running into is I'm, I'm flexing my Gradle skills uh, right now so I can get some better uh, native builds with some of these projects. I'm having fun. Yeah, and so somebody just said, wow, cool, dig that calendar uh, following the releases. Yeah, so not only can you see what is getting released, but if you go ahead and grab one of these, let's just say Spring Framework 6, and we go ahead and open that in a new tab, that is going to go to the GitHub repo and go to the milestone, the project page, and kind of list everything out that's in there. So we can see there's four open things, 98 closed you can go through here and see what went into that specific release. So really great way to kind of get ahead and see what's coming down the pipe. Um, and then obviously when we do something like a release candidate, I'm guessing there'll be some release notes that come out with that. And yeah, and um, I think, you know, one of one of the more popular videos that, that I've released on the Spring Developer channel was, hey, what's new in Spring Boot 2.7? And Instead of just looking at those release notes, maybe we can go through and like talk about those things that are being released because sometimes just looking at a line item on a release note may not tell the whole story. So, you know, I, I know we hope that we can go through some of the things that we're going to be releasing here in Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6. Uh, that's going to be a lot of, of what I would like to cover, you know, the rest of the year because it's going to be on everybody's mind. So. Um, <clears throat> lots of great comments. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, are, are you going to do best practices? Uh, today is actually a really good day. If this is your first time tuning in, it's a really good day uh, to talk about these best practices and architectures and what we're going to see uh, on the way to uh, production. So great day for you. Um, also like, hey, yeah, we have been covering uh, Spring Security. Uh, there's different levels, different facets of how Spring Security integrates with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, and there's a bunch. And here's the magic part is we're not just coming here to kind of uh, show you one thing and move on. This is an interactive, uh, it's office hours. Uh, for those of you that went to university in the US, the, the concept of bring your questions. You have an opportunity to bring your questions to us. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but we have Slack with uh, the fine folks that are doing the development. And we want to get your answers back to you. Uh, and one of the things we've been saying is that in my house, if you come to dinner and you don't eat, you leave hungry, that's your fault. Same with spring office hours, bring your questions. If you don't ask your questions, then we can't help you. And then I'm going to put that on you. So we want you to come with questions. And if we don't get to it today, it is just a one hour show. We have time between now and the next show to go and we'll circle back and we'll bring those questions to you or those answers to you. Uh, yeah, from the experts. So bring your question. <clears throat> yeah, and I don't think we have a, sh we don't have a particular topic for next week. So I think we'll play some catch up on some of these questions. Um, yeah. And next week's show may be a chance to just kind of answer questions. So get those questions to us. Uh, we do keep track of them, even if we can't get to them today. So that's the calendar. That's what's coming new. I also like to go ahead and take a look at the spring blog. If you're not aware, spring.io slash blog. There is a really, really good post on here from Mark Pollock on the Spring Data Team, uh, Spring Team in general, um, and it's embracing virtual threads. Uh, so he talks about Project Loom. We know Project Loom is, is now out, uh, at least in Java 19 in a preview mode. There are some Project Loom features that made it into Java 19. Um, so Mark goes through what virtual threads are, what does that mean for you as a Spring developer? Um, what can we expect? Uh, what, what, is there something we could do right now? And he actually goes into a demo that you can take a look at right now um, and then talks, obviously, this will kind of change as that goes out of preview and becomes more of a, a, you know, a standardized feature. So really great article. If you've been hearing about Project Loom and virtual threads, what, what are they? What do they mean? This is a really good, great place to start. So thanks, Mark, for that one. Um, and then finally, we mentioned it earlier, but Spring One, we are back in in-person. This is an all-in-person event, not virtual, not a hybrid. We are all going to be in San Francisco December 6th through the 8th. Uh, for Spring 1, there is a whole bunch of really great content on the website that you can check out. If you go under speakers, you can find out uh, what speakers are going to be joining us. I believe 40 to 50% of the content is up there. 
So if you go down and, and find someone uh, like our good friend Ryan Baxter, you can go ahead and click on him and see what he's talking about. You can also go into, um, you can drill down into sessions and find out, you know, based on a particular topic, what you're looking for. And you can also look at workshops. And if we look at that first one there, getting started with Spring Boot, Dan Vega and Deshaun Carter. So, hey, uh, if you have not, if you are planning on going and you have not signed up yet, this, uh, we have two workshops there. And these, I'm being told, all sell out pretty quick. So if you're interested, sign up for it. Spend a couple hours with Deshaun and I, and we will go through kind of getting started with Spring Boot. So that's Spring One. If you, We'll try and get that. Uh, there's a promo code that'll give you $200 off. We will find that and get that in the chat for you. Um, that's Spring One. Uh, anybody in the chat? I see a lot of people in the chat. Anybody going to Spring One? Anybody interested in going? What are you looking forward to seeing? Let us know. Awesome. I'm going to try to keep up with the questions, and I will review those at the end. Uh, but there's lots of great questions. Again, feel free to ask. Uh, this is being streamed on multiple channels, so I'm trying to kind of share across channel uh, what's happening. Uh, will is asking, uh, is this uh, Spring One content going to be streamed? No, it will not be streamed. Uh, it'll be prioritized for the people that are there. Uh, eventually, some of the stuff is going to make it out. Um, but yeah, it, it's not going to be streamed live. Uh, you'll have to uh, show up. Uh, yeah. All right. So I think that's all we got with kind of you know, our normal kind of cadence, what we do at the beginning of a show. Uh, what we're going to go into now is kind of our topic for today, which is spring to production. So I have a bunch of things to look at, but I want to just start with a discussion around um, what it means to get to production. So before we even look at like options of, of different services out there that are going to help us do this, if we're just building a, a Spring Boot app today, Deshaun, and I, I think I have everything figured out, maybe I just have this simple uh, blogging application that I wrote, uh, connects to a database, it has some configuration, I'm ready to take this thing live. Um, what are my options? Like how, how can I get something that can I can go ahead and take out and, and put into production somewhere? Yeah, what are they? Like one of the things is where are we going to start? We have our initializer. Uh, we can start there. It's awesome. Um, but once you've done that, like once you've gotten past the basics, which we've been covering a lot of here, once you've gotten past the basics, then what? Uh, I like to say I'm a proud founder of dozens of failed startups along the way, but I've been part of some successful ones as well. And one of the things that I like to preach, uh, share, and it's a lesson learned is like, you got to get things working on your laptop first. But that doesn't mean that it can't be shared out in the open. Uh, so maybe not today, but uh, one of the shows coming up, we're also going to show you how to make things um, accessible from your laptop, your your demo, before you go and invest a bunch of money in a data center or, or uh, some cloud infrastructure. Uh, get it running on your laptop first. That MVP should work on your laptop. And Spring has a lot of great and easy ways to make that happen. Uh, so that's where my mind is. But after that, once you've kind of gotten beyond the laptop, then what? That's my question. And Dan has done a lot of research on this already. Yeah. So I think I wanted to start here. So when I'm when I'm at start.spring.io and I fill all this information out about my project, there's this packaging thing. And there's an option for jar and there's an option for war. Um, what are these things? Like what do, why should I care? Do, you know, the default choice is jar. Um, as Josh famously says, make jar not war. Um, war, do we do you use this for anything anymore? Do you package as well? I know some companies still do because they have their own infrastructure in place and they may that's they may be supporting legacy systems that do that. But is your default go-to now just uh, simply to package as a, as a jar? I can't think of the last time that I packaged something as a, a war file. I think it has uh, it's been at least seven or eight years um, since I've done that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know there's still people that are doing it. Um, but me personally, I have not. All right. So if I package it as a jar, that gives me the ability to do what with it? Where, where can I send this jar? Pretty uh, much well, anywhere? The, uh, yeah. The, the nice thing about the jar packaging is you can actually uh, package those as executable jars. So when I do a build, I can 
I can run it right there. Uh, we have our Maven plugin uh, and the Gradle plugins where we can actually just run it locally. Um, but you can also set it up as an executable jar so I can deploy it as a service uh, running on my laptop and let system D or whatever the system is uh, restart it as needed and, and manage it as a, another service. So you have all these cool uh, things that you can go. And then you also have the idea of I can put into a container. Again, all of these things are kind of out of the box, uh, built in, and it's super easy. Maybe we should show that part first, show how easy it is to like, hey, I've got an executable jar. Hey, I've got a, a container. That might be a good place to start. We've shown it all enough right. on the show, but we could do a quick one. Do you want, um, actually, I think I have, let's see if we can just pull something up here. Um all right, let me open just a previous project that I had. So I wasn't ready for this. I should have been, but <clears throat> I had this like quick hosted blog sample application that I had. And I was just using this to kind of post to different services, some of which we're going to talk about today. Um, so uh, let's talk about that. So when I created this uh, back at start.spring.io, it gave me that option as jar war, and I left it as jar. Uh, so if you look in here, uh, we have all the properties for application, what version I was on. Um, here's my group ID, my artifact. We have a description. We have properties. And then um, I think we just have, is it not in here anymore? Oh, I thought it the project type was in here, but I guess not. So this is by default where you can go ahead and build a jar. So one of the ways that we can do that, um, so we can open up a terminal, we can also come into um, this Maven plugin here. So I'm gonna come in here. This has actually using a Maven wrapper. So if I'm in the project, I should be in there, right? So we can just say Maven wrapper, clean package. And if we look at that, um, that's going to go through and package up our application. And you can see that we get this jar. So building jar users uh, hosted blog snapshot.jar. So that's in the target and then hosted blog snapshot.jar. So this includes everything that we need, right? Right, Deshaun? This is like, hey, uh, everything that Spring is going to give me, all of my code, um, that execute the, uh, the embedded version of Tomcat. So I should be able to essentially, because that has everything that I need, I should be able to just say java jar and then come into target and then say hosted blog. And then it will go ahead and run my service and my service is up and running. So because it has everything there, I can go ahead and take that jar and push it anywhere, push it up to you know some type of cloud service, um, things like Heroku and AWS and Azure and Google Cloud, um, they all kind of take this um, executable jar, right? This Uber jar, because it, it contains everything. So, so that's one approach. Um, what's another thing we can do here? We can Spring Boot build image. So yeah, so we can say um, Maven wrapper, Spring Boot. Build image, or is that the greater one? Whoops, sorry. Build dash, yep. Well, what is this doing, Deshaun? This is so doing all the this, Docker things. Yep, so this is pulling down build packs. Uh, but again, you get it out of the box. So if you've got Docker running, uh, this is the build image is allowing you to build a OCI image of your Spring Boot app. That's it. So you don't have to go and build a Docker file. It's all done for you. And it's using the latest and greatest from upstream, right? It's grabbing it from uh, Paquetto and it'll grab the latest version. Uh, you can also switch. We had one of those questions earlier uh, on a previous show. You can switch and you can configure how that OCI image is being configured uh, in output, but these are OCI compliant images. Uh, so you can run it on Docker, you can run it on Kubernetes, you can run it on, on other. And it's nice, you get it out of the box so that those are kind of the two main outputs. Yep. Uh, I think I'm definitely leaning more towards having these images, these OCI images over storing a jar file. Um, yeah, and that's where I'm at today, but there's options for both. Again, and one of the where you're at. One of the big pros for containers is 
I mean, it's going to be the same on your machine as it is on my machine, right? Like there is no, there is no change there. It's going to be the same. Um, and, you know, any, anytime you start writing your own Docker file, especially over here in Java Spring Boot, um, you should go ahead and pause and, and reevaluate life because you're, <laughs> you're, you're spending your time in the wrong place. Uh, unless, you, unless this is something you do all the time and you're very good at, then great. You are, you are way better than, than we are because I would much rather focus my time on something else. Uh, so, so using these build packs that come, come kind of bundled with, with our Spring Boot apps, definitely a plus. Um, I still have another question I want to answer real quick. What is more preferred slash used in the industry, Maven or Grado? So again, I my kind of default too is Maven. And I think if you look at a lot of the surveys around, like a lot of people are still using Maven over Grado. But I will say it, it, both of them are very great solutions. Um, one thing that if you ever get into having to customize the build process, and you need to like write, you know, write your own plugins or write your own code. Uh, Gradle's really great at that because I don't know about you, but I'm not like I, I've never written a Maven plugin. I'm sure it's not; it can't be that hard. But being able to do that is is a lot harder than in a, a Gradle build file, just writing some code that can do something and kind of hooking into one of the build steps. So I found that if you need to like customize the build process. Gradle is a really great approach. They're both great. Um, I'm not going to say one is better than the other. As with everything in software, it depends on what you're doing, right? Um, you can't go wrong with either of them. I use Maven a lot. Uh, I've used Gradle for things in the past. So sorry for the non-answer. <laughs> <I'm gonna go. laughs> um, one of our, our regulars uh, is asking about uh, the build packs, asking if like, hey, is this right? Like, should we be doing this? Um, could you scroll back up, Dan, uh, and show like, hey, why are we pulling these images build packs from Bellsoft? Why are we depending on this third party company for production? Uh, so Bellsoft is your JVM. That's your JDK. That's what is going to run. That's the runtime that is putting into the Docker image. You can definitely put in your own, uh, but this is one that's supported upstream. So my question back to you is, if you're not using Bellsoft, which one are you using? These are the open source uh, options, and these are ones that are supported out of the box. So beyond this, um, if you are looking for support, um, you have options of getting support all the way down. So you can have uh, a support contract with these build back outputs. And that's something that, you know, we're not here to talk about that kind of stuff, but uh, you have options. And I'm going to ask like, hey, I would love to have a conversation and, and uh, talk about where you're at because you've had a lot of uh, questions over the past few weeks and I want to help. I want to help. And I think that uh, a one-on-one -on -one might answer a lot of those questions uh, quicker. And then we, maybe we could turn it into a show. We could turn it into a segment and discuss what we've, dis what we've talked about. So uh, yeah, send me a, a message and let's talk. Um, uh, and then here's another question. How do you override application properties using build image? Uh, we can, because of the, uh, the class, let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, I think I have uh, an example. Uh, I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to grab the screen here. Give me one okay. sec. Uh, we, can, we can pass in those configurations. So I'm going to talk about the Maven uh, build pack. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm trying to hurry because we do have some stuff we want to show. Uh, so that, uh, share screen. Uh, which one? This one. Share. And let's add that up here. All right. I'm going to go to um, buildpacks.io. Ah, no, I think I want to go to uh, Paquetto. Oh, Buildpack, Java. Uh, and I'm going to show without jumping into the tool. No, that's not what I wanted. Here we go. Um, I can pass in all of these configurations uh, into my config for Maven. Uh, let me see if I have a, a project that I can pull up as an example. Uh, uh, here we go. Um, so I, I like to deploy things to Raspberry Pis. Uh, whoops. So what I do is I, I changed, 
I don't have to use the build pack. I don't have to use what was there. Uh, I made my own build pack. Uh, it's pulling from the upstream build pack, uh, but I made it so I could deploy to ARM64. And here's an example of things that I can pass into that build pack. So I can pass into the plugin, which is going to pass configurations into the build pack uh, for things like uh, JVM size, uh, uh, memory, uh, garbage collection types, uh, whether you want a, a uh, native image or not, you can pass those in and there's an example. This is a public repository to go and take a look. And the other option, uh, the documentation on Paquetto has great examples. So hopefully that answered. Backwards. Yeah, Spencer uh, Gibb, who's on the Spring team, just ch chimed in too. It says Bellsoft is a JVM that VM VMware supports commercially. So thank you, Spencer, for that. Yeah, awesome. Cool. So I think what I want to do now is I want to take a look at some options in getting our project. Now that we know how to build them, we, we saw some options there. What are some options to get our projects into production? And as I said at the beginning of this, we don't we don't have like this great big list of things to give to you and hand off to you. I've been getting this question a lot lately from different angles. Like, hey, I am a some I'm a person who is just trying to learn Spring, and I want to get a project out into the wild. How do I do it? Then there is another persona of, hey, we have this really great startup idea, and we're building on top of Spring. Where does that project go? Then maybe there's another persona of, hey, we're building this very large distributed application and we need enterprise support. Where does that project go? So what we're going to do is look through some options today, figure out how we can kind of classify them so that we can put a list together to kind of hand off to everyone in the community. Because I, I think that's one thing that's kind of missing is, you know, what is your persona? What are you trying to do? And then what are your options for getting, getting that thing into production, right? So I came across and looked at, you know, I found a bunch of options. I also um, asked these questions out on Twitter. I got a bunch of like feedback. And I know Ted's joining us today. Ted uh, kind of gave me a couple options. And the first one he gave me is one that I was not familiar with. And so I want to show that off right away, which is Railway. So railway, I would consider this kind of a um, like an abstraction, like an easy abstraction on top of some other cloud provider. Um, but what this lets you do is just kind of push your code to say a Git repository on GitHub, and they have a free tier. A free tier, so you can see up here this free tier I started has like 500 hours. And if you want to get an application out there um, just to kind of check it out, this is a really good way to do so. And as you can see. I was able to get a, um, uh, a blog up there this morning. Um, and then if you go ahead and hit it, uh, I, can, I have a particular uh, REST endpoint at API slash posts. And there's a way to go ahead and hit a REST API. So that's one option. Um, again, I think what we want to hear from you guys here in the chat what options have you used in the past for getting things into production? We'll make note of that. Maybe we could take a look at one if we don't already have it on our list. And again, what buckets can we put these into? Um, so right off the bat, Deshaun, what would you what would you classify this as? Um, do you do, do you agree with my kind of initial personas? Like, I'm someone trying to learn. Let's just get get something free out there. Maybe I'm a, a startup trying to get the next Twitter out there, but I'm starting with no users. And then I'm an enterprise. Do those feel like good buckets to you? Um, yeah, there, there's some kind of matrix here about like uh, cost, value, other. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a great place to start. All right. Um, and the only reason I ask is because as we're looking at these, I just want to put these into buckets in my head so that we can get this kind of document or something together to give to the community on, on what we go through today. So another one that is near and dear to my heart is Heroku. So I know as soon as everybody sees Heroku, they're going to go, ah, but, but there's no free option anymore. <laughs> and that's true. Uh, there is no free option as of like November 28th. But um, there, again, it's as a developer and, and me wanting to get something out into production, 
this makes it very easy. I just get my code out there. I don't have to worry about all the, you know, the infrastructure stuff. Um, so Heroku, I think another great option. <clears throat> um, I saw a, oh, here's Ted. Railway is very much like Heroku, though with fewer options. Uses our favorite build packs for deployment. Yeah, I actually noticed that, though. The build packs on Railway were a little bit different. They had a Paquetto build pack, but it was, like, deprecated, and they were using something else that I was not familiar with. Um, let me just see if it's in here. Yeah, uh, Nix packs. Again, I'm not huge into the build pack world, so if you've if you've done build packs before, maybe that is a big one out there. I, I just haven't I hadn't heard about it in, until until today. So, and Spencer's answering questions, following what K pack. Oh, I think that's why. Why do we need Docker? Why do we need Docker to build the image? Uh, you need something to build the image, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to run. But it it doesn't have to be Docker desktop, for example. You just need something that that can build the images. You need some container platform because the build packs are containers themselves. So you have to have some way of running them. Um, All right. Yeah. So Railway, Heroku. The other couple of these that I want to point out are things that I have not used yet. But as we talked about earlier, one of the ways that you can create an artifact to deploy is by creating a Docker container. So if you go out to some of these hosting options and you don't see Java Spring as an option, maybe they only support Go or Rails, but a lot of them have Docker as an option on there, then guess what? It supports your Java and your Spring apps. So things like render, if you go underneath the docs here, you're going to see Node and Docker and Ruby and Python and Go and no Java. But because we can take a Docker image here, we can build that Docker image and use something like render. I haven't used it personally, but I've heard a lot of great things about render. Uh, so that's another one we'll kind of add to the list. Uh, <clears throat> another one similar to render. Is that render.com? Render. It's render.io. Uh, I-O. Oh, I'm sorry. It is render.com. I okay, thought... Render. Sorry, fly was fly was uh, that. <clears throat> and yeah, um, the image will be running anywhere. Wonderful, yeah. So again, if you if you can create an image, a lot of these like cloud providing services will support you, even if they say they don't. Uh, another one is fly.io. Um, just uh, again, I've heard a lot of great things about it. I haven't used it personally, but again, it does take a Docker image. You don't see Java on here, but Docker, so. Uh, that'll work. Yeah. Another interesting one I ran across was porter.run. Um, so there, this is also, if you're moving, if you're migrating from something like Heroku, they do have a white glove Heroku migration service. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, maybe take a look at that. So those are, those are kind of my um, like abstraction on top of some other cloud provider options that are hey just give me a give me a jar give me a container give me uh, the location of your GitHub repository and we'll take care of the rest for you no provisioning uh, get up and running and some of these have free tiers which again is is a good option if you are in that first bucket of hey I'm just learning Spring and I want to get it out there hey Dan uh, yep. Matt says hey I never hear about any of these like do you announce these anywhere uh, maybe because we've kind of been uh, yeah, kicking the tires on this format. Uh, it's really gained uh, momentum and popularity uh, over the last few weeks. We are still just doing one show per week. Uh, we expect that to change in the future. Um, but yeah, now today is the first day that we actually are streaming on the Spring Developer channel on YouTube. But we're actually streaming across multiple channels across different platforms. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned to where you normally get your information. Uh, you found us today. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to find us uh, again next week. Uh, but yeah, right now, it's pretty regular. Uh, at the same time every week. And yeah, and I'd say check out tanzu.vmware.com, the developer center. There's a whole bunch of free resources on there, but Spring Office Hours is one of the shows. So if you go under Tanzu TV and you go to Spring Office Hours, you can always see what is coming next. We usually get these scheduled a week out, and then you can go ahead and take a look at past episodes as well. And uh, the questions that we get here, 
um, like, hey, what's the data grid for the front end? I need a searchable data grid for my timely project. Uh, Spring Native services in serverless containers. These are actually all things that we are are talking about, and we have uh, we have content for them. Uh, and a lot of times, if we don't cover it here, it's going to end up on the Tonsu Developer Center. Uh, so we're making guides along the way to address the things that you are dealing with uh, as you're on your journey to production. So yeah, you have tons of options, but it's all the same ecosystem and we're gonna uh, yeah, cover as much of it as possible. Some content is gonna be better in the live format and some of it's gonna be better as a guide uh, that can be easier consumed by the thousands. All right, next up on my list, Cloud Foundry. Uh, so this this changed a lot of things. I know um, we were talking before the show at a previous position, we at a Fortune 50 company, we used the pivotal version of this, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and this kind of changed, changed the game as far as Java and Spring goes, just being able to CF push something uh, to Cloud Foundry. So um, yeah, Cloud Foundry is more of the top level project, right? And then Pivotal Cloud Foundry was like the pivotal offering of that. Mm -hmm. So Cloud Foundry is open source. You could find different implementations of it, uh, different providers, if you will. Um, but yeah, it gives you a really easy way to just go ahead and push something up and uh, push something in it. And it's a cloud provider, right? When I think of platform, this is what I think of. I think of Cloud Foundry and the developer experience of just CF push, uh, yep. my code goes. You know, it's not really CF push. Not a lot of developers were doing that, but it could commit <laughs> and then some pipeline takes that and lands it in production. Yep. Uh, and I've seen amazing uh, platforms, amazing infrastructure and uh, path to production, paved path to production <laughs> uh, built around Cloud Foundry. Cool. All right. So those were kind of the first buckets I had. Um, the next ones, again, uh, a little bit more provisioning, but the, hey, we're going to give you the power to do everything, anything and everything that you want, uh, which is pretty cool. So I know DigitalOcean, I use them in the past for just virtual machines. So I know you can get uh, just a VM up and running if you want um, and pretty much do what with, you know, whatever you need with it. Um, so that's an option. And then we have our cloud providers. So if you want to use something like AWS, um, <clears throat> if you can use that. Um, you know, one of the one of the uh, complaints, if you will, that I hear from uh, developers that are just trying to learn Spring, maybe for the first time, is you know, I'm I'm a little bit scared to to just put my credit card in to AWS because I hear horror stories about this. And I think with any cloud provider. I think that is one thing you need to be very aware of up front. But there are ways to mitigate that too. With every service, you have ways to do kind of billing notifications. Like, hey, my billing threshold is $5. If you go over $5, cut that off. And especially in a, in a, in a, in a world where you're just pushing some sample application up, right? Make sure you understand the billing uh, for each of these cloud providers. So. If you understand that, um, these these shouldn't be that scary. Uh, so obviously, AWS, uh, we have Google Cloud, uh, some really great products over there. And then one that we're going to talk a little bit more about today, which is Microsoft's offering, which is Azure. And Azure specifically has something called Azure Spring Apps. So we are going to take a look at that. And I think Deshaun is That's... going to walk us through something. Yeah, or do you want to go through some... Yeah, let's let's talk about it. The the difference. Uh, so I'll, I'm gonna uh, pull my stuff up, but I'll, I'll talk about it first. Uh, yeah. The idea that um, I have a jar file or I have some image. Uh, I I do a talk called "My Children Will Never Deploy Active Passive." <laughs> uh, let me see if I can pull uh, mine up here. Uh, and what I did there was I kind of try to talk about like the different phases that you might be in uh, of your application. Uh, and I used Azure Spring Apps to do the deployment. And I know that if you go into any of the large clouds, they have these basic constructs, uh, a VM, or they have some managed services like a database where you might have been used to uh, in doing the install and having some scripts that do your updates for your Oracle or your uh, Postgres or MySQL. Um, in, in the cloud, they understand that you're using a database. Uh, so they are going to manage that database for you. 
uh, it, they're not all equal, uh, but you've got options. And what we want to help you do is, is get the right option for what you're trying to do. Uh, and in the past, uh, we had options where it was just easy. Uh, there was, I used Elastic Beanstalk uh, for a while for my, my job app. And I go and I get this Elastic infrastructure. Uh, and Azure Spring Apps is kind of the one that allows the most flexibility. It kind of fits the, the talk track that I was trying to deliver. Uh, and, and here's just an example of, oh, I need to increase my font. I apologize. Uh, but I just have like this Terraform. This is, hey, go and deploy different regions. Well, where's my font? I'm going to make it bigger so everybody can see. Uh, sure. Ah, cool. Um, and yeah, it gives you this flexibility of, hey, I want to deploy to one region. This one is a single region in North Europe. Go and deploy my stuff. Azure Spring Apps under the covers is Kubernetes, uh, but it also has uh, some really cool integrations with the rest of the ecosystem. And that's why I like it. It's For me, it's got the plus plus things that I need uh, in order to go to production, uh, but I don't have to think about it. So yeah, it just works. Your head knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but it, it can be, if you're new to the cloud, uh, I'm providing here Terraform as an example of these are the things you kind of need to understand. And I break out my Terraform, not a standard, but it shows me, hey, I've got an Azure resource group. My resource group is called Single Region. It's in North Europe. That's cool. Uh, and then I'm going to deploy some Redis Enterprise databases. And it gives me, this is all the stuff I need. I want to have it linked. So it's linked to that cluster. Here's the cluster. And that cluster spreads it across different uh, zones in that region. So I'm doing kind of uh, mature deployment. But the whole point of the conversation is my kids are never going to deploy active passive. The idea of having infrastructure uh, that's just sitting there waiting for something else to fail uh, and, and be set up. We don't have to do that these days. Uh, there are tons of options to deploy um, active active and have things in multiple regions and in multiple zones uh, spread out across the globe. So as I'm using these resources to deploy, uh, I might grow Hey, from that single region. Maybe we haven't reach that thousand customer threshold where we need to uh, bounce it across different regions. So I go from the next, I go to the next thing is, hey, let's now deploy uh, an active active deployment of Redis Enterprise and do it in multiple regions. Let me go to my resource group. Main region is here, but I'm grabbing from multiple uh, regions. Where's my variables? Uh, where's my, oh, locals here, sorry, Ron. So here in this case, I'm deploying to five different regions across the globe uh, and just using Inter Redis Enterprise to kind of back up. But that Redis Enterprise is a managed service. I don't have to be the expert. I can just deploy it and say, yes, I want all of that capability. And then at the end, I can go and destroy one of the regions. And one of the regions that has both a Redis Enterprise cluster and an Azure Spring app version of that application, destroy the region and everything still works. That's the idea. Um, so again, with time, it's, it's a great way, but all of these, I think the goal here, and we've had a lot of questions, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, we had a lot of questions on, Hey, it's DevOps. Like, where do we go? We want to see that. One of the first questions today was, uh, can you show us some of these architectures, some of these best practices? And I get a clear understanding from the questions that we've had today that maybe we want to start showing more of that. Uh, showing what a reference example looks like. So uh, let's let's jump back here I, real quick. Yeah, I do want to ask a question when it comes to something like Azure Spring Apps. Um, and I think I, I had that same question for you. So what are some of the features that kind of sets this apart? Like why, why would you choose something like ASA? Like what are things that you would need to, that, that it can do for you? Oops, sorry, uh, that is a great question, why? So I'm gonna put this up here. Why, why ASA? Why Azure Spring Apps? So again, I'm just keeping track of the questions that were answered. Uh, this is my little notes. Uh, when I'm doing development, uh, I'm just gonna say, hey, here's me. I'm gonna draw my little, I think, developer. Uh, uh, never mind. 
Hello. Excali is great, by the way. Excaladra, if for those of you who don't know, every time I, I show one of these diagrams in a presentation or on a YouTube video, I always get those questions. Like, yeah. what is that? <laughs> uh, really great tool. Something is not letting me type here. There we go. Uh, so this is my app. It works on my laptop. Uh, and the thing is, uh, Jitter Ted kind of said it like Azure, uh, it just kind of works. I don't want to have to be an expert on the the infrastructure, right? The the cloud. If I want to take something to uh, production, uh, and the reason I like Azure Spring Apps is because when I do a push, when I do uh, deploy that application, uh, let's call it, um, I get a lot of the other benefits, like uh, metrics. Uh, it automatically knows how to plug in and uh, yeah, integrates well with my Spring Boot apps. So I love that out of the box. I don't have to think about those things that we talked about last time with Jonathan. All of the observability things, everything that I'm exposing via uh, my Spring observability, by my micrometer, uh, I get the benefit of having that well integrated with the ecosystem. Uh, integrate, integrated with, uh, with everything. Everything. Hopefully, yeah, I'll, I'll move that over. Um, and also, um, yeah, it's I don't have to think about about the infrastructure. So that's another benefit, but it's not the only one. You know, we have a lot of these where, hey, I'm deploying it to some cloud. And I know how it's going to work. It's going to be up and running. But here, I know that there, I can grow. <clears throat> so this is why it's my default. And I'll go ahead and add on the available manage. Um, I like what's on the menu yep. uh, with that gets included in the Azure ecosystem. So it makes it a really nice fit for what I'm trying to do. Uh, and that's one of the benefits that I like. That's why that's my default. Yeah, I would say one of the big things that I came across was like, if you're doing any any kind of, if you're building any kind of distributed applications with something like Spring Cloud and you need service discovery and you need, um, you know, configuration. Um, these are things that if you, if you were just building a single app and you wanted to deploy to one of those other things that we talked about earlier where it just kind of checks out your git your 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 github repo and build something for you that's fine in a monolith application but when you get into these distributed applications that have all these different services like service discovery and you know a centralized configuration to multiple applications um, these different you know, cloud provider apps uh, like ASA um, has that built right in, which is really nice. And I skipped right over these super important features. The idea that um, I don't know how it works on the other systems. Uh, you're teaching me about these other options that we discussed, uh, Railway, Heroku. Uh, the idea of, hey, if I deploy a bunch of stuff, uh, can they talk to each other? Is it easy? Is there an easy way to talk to each other? Is it an easy way to scale up? Uh, can I do auto scaling? Um, those are things that I don't know about the others, but I do know uh, are available here with the Azure Spring apps. Uh, I think part of what we're going to have to do and share with the community is make sure that we're giving them an understanding of why you might choose one over the other, mm -hmm. uh, what what you can do with option A versus option B, uh, yep. and kind of build out that and have a good shared understanding of why you might choose one over the other. But yeah, the other part is the the integrated configuration. I can have a GitHub repository where I can say, hey, everybody that's deployed in this uh, Azure Spring Apps instance is going to get their configuration from this repo. And as they get deployed, they're configured. That 12-factor uh, feature. Yeah. Of, you know, let my environment tell me how to be configured. Yeah. And, and that becomes super, again, it, it depends on what you're building, right? Because if, if you're if you're building the next Twitter and you're going on the Today Show and you're going to talk about it and you expect all this traffic, the $5 hosting plan on one of those first ones we talked about is probably not a great option, right? Like you need something that is going to scale. So it really all at the end of the day depends as with everything does in, in software, it depends on what you're doing. So cool. I like that. I like these notes though. Again, I think part of 
again, these are live streams. These are not, we don't come in with a script here. We come in and have discussions about things. And, you know, I really wanted to have this discussion about, you know, getting spring apps into production so that we could put these notes together and get a resource together to kind of share out with the community. So I saw some other ones um, mentioned that we didn't mention that I wanted to get in there. Paul said Oracle Cloud, OpenShift, Alibaba Cloud, um, Alibaba Cloud, especially for one anyone outside of North America. Uh, so thank you, Paul, for sharing those with yeah, us. We talked about Oracle Cloud uh, and their super generous uh, uh, free tier. But we've, we've talked about these in the show, and I think it would be good to kind of have some examples of mm -hmm. how we take from start.spring.io uh, to these services. If, there, if that would be valuable, we want to show you. But yeah, having these um, options identified uh, at first, Alibaba. Uh, yeah, these are all great options. Um, what else? Uh, interesting. So How many instances? How are they distributed? Yeah, are they multi-region? Um, do you have the option to pick your regions? Um, those kinds of things become more important depending on where you are in that maturity, right? If all of my uh, customers are here in Kansas City uh, for my little startup, then maybe just a central region is great. Um, but does Railway, Heroku, do the others, can they make a good experience for my customers here in Kansas City? Uh, at scale, I, I like to say that latency is the new downtime. And those kinds of decisions matter. Maybe not for your one or two instances, but when you're at that 10,000 or more instances of an application and your customer's um, experience is the business, uh, those kinds of decisions have a really, really large impact. Uh, what else? I'm trying to convince my company cloud native build packs is the way to go. Um, and I would just like to say, hey, if, if your company is building Docker files, uh, who's maintaining them? How much time are they spending maintaining those Docker files? Because mm -hmm. uh, I know that those container scans are going to pick up more from a hand uh, delivered Docker file than uh, yeah, than they are from the, the build pack. So there's, there's a trade off there, but everything is a negotiation. There's always the, it depends. Um, but I have lived that life of, Hey, a new CDE comes out and it's affecting all these Docker files that I had created. And then I had to go and redo the pipeline for all those Docker files. That's another feature of Azure spring apps is when something comes out, uh, it's also using Tanzu build service under the hood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what that means is uh, the OCI image, let me draw another image here, uh, a typical uh, container. Uh, it has a, uh, please hold, OS layer. Uh, there may be a runtime layer uh, and an application layer. Uh, so the OS, uh, Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat. Then the runtime, I'm going to do Java. So it's going to deploy a JDK. Uh, on a different layer. These Docker images are typically considered as, as layers. They could be just TGZs. Uh, an OCI image makes it so that I can actually switch, I can pull out uh, an OS layer and leave everything else the same. So the idea that I can, uh, a CVE comes out and I'm using something like Azure Spring Apps uh, and these OCI compliant images, I can have confidence that if there is a CVE in the OS layer, I can have tons of build service go out and I can update just the OS layer. I don't have to rebuild everything. I can send out that tiny layers updates to all the containers that are running because I know what I've built. That's all a part of that system. So the updates get out there faster. I've got confidence uh, and I can go forward. I don't have to think about it. Uh, so those upstream cloud native build packs allow me to do that first step. Uh, having a service like uh, Azure Spring Apps allows me to do the second part where, hey, maybe it was a uh, problem in the JVM. Uh, go just replace that layer and keep on going. I don't have to make changes in my uh, application layer and all of those things are handled by the managed, managed service. Great stuff. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, go ahead and let us know in the chat. Um, either if you're joining us live, let us know in the chat. If you're watching the replay, let us know in the comments. Is, is this information helpful would you like us to put some type of guide together around this stuff you know we are, we're not going to waste our time if, if nobody wants this but yeah. we figured we were getting enough questions around this that uh this would be something that would be helpful so let us know if you if you want a guide or a more 
structured content around, hey, I got this application. I want to get it into production. How do I do it? So uh, I'm going to throw this out there too. Dan does a great job of making these videos and setting up these guides. So these are things that we might not cover here uh, in the office hours, but we might point you to the guide or the video that was made to answer some of these questions. We want to help you move forward. We want to help you get to reduction. We've talked about observability, just the value of having a health check uh, in your application. Adding that actuator is a huge benefit and it's a huge bonus of the Spring ecosystem and what Spring Boot provides. You get a lot of this nice integration top to bottom. Yeah, that allows you to go to production with a little bit more confidence than you might. So this has been great. We have lots of things to think about. Um, I think for the office hours, again, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, what would you like to see next? I think we have a lot on uh, the DevOps side of things, these best practices. We should really just start from zero, uh, go build an application and deploy it to one of these services and just talk about what it does along the way and say, hey, we've done it. Um, and maybe since we talked the most about Azure Spring Apps, we'll do that next show. Like just, uh, we will prepare and we will talk about going from zero to an app running on Azure Spring Apps that everybody can hit and see. And we can talk about all of the things along the way, why you would choose something like this, why you would do something like that. Uh, and yeah, and make that our next episode. Yeah, maybe we can um, take what we've learned today, like I said, put together a little bit more of some structured content and maybe actually build an app and deploy it to, like I said, we have these buckets. Maybe we do one to like a small free tier, one to like a startup tier where we could scale later, and one to an enterprise tier like an Azure Spring Apps. Yeah. Does, does Azure Spring Apps show you, hey, is it up and running? Yes. Uh, Azure Spring Apps will automatically connect to those health checks and give you the insights like I talked about over here. Uh, the metrics are well integrated so I can have all of those benefits. It can, and I can, I can move things. Hey, that, that region is down. I can have it replicated to another region. So you have tons of benefit. Uh, best resources for learning Spring Framework and Spring Boot. Uh, I'm going to say today, go look at Dan's channel. He's got tons of stuff top to bottom. Uh, but besides that, you're going to want to come to Spring 1 and come to our workshop. Uh, I think those are the best places to get started and just start. Start somewhere. Yeah. Bring your questions. I, I actually answered this in a recent newsletter. So if you head over to my website and check out some recent, they're, they're free. You don't have to sign up or anything. You can just read them. But I think one of the, the, the things I started out with is you got to ask yourself what you want to learn Spring for, because Spring can do so many things. It is a solution to so many problems. So just saying I want to learn Spring is it's a pretty vast question. Um, so figure out exactly what you want to learn. And then you can start asking like, okay, what do I need to learn now? I, I put a bunch of resources in there. So I think that would be a really good place to start. Uh, Sagar, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, check out our episode with Jonathan. Uh, he goes deep into monitoring and instrumentation and what you get with Spring. Uh, he does touch on open telemetry and Prometheus. Uh, take a look at that episode and come back next week with any questions that you have. Yeah, and more importantly, um, as we move forward uh, towards Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3, that was a, an important episode to understand what changes are coming with like Micrometer, you know, doing a lot of the things, uh, Sleuth kind of going away. So yeah, take a look at that episode, um, see what's coming. And, and I think it's really simplifying a lot of the questions around observability. Uh, so hopefully that answers some things. Excellent, yeah. Uh, simple guys, CICD, we can talk about what that looks like, uh, GitHub Actions or uh, Choreographer. There's tons of ways. Uh, and that developer experience uh, is a big part of what, why you might choose one over the other. Big fan of GitHub in general and GitHub Actions. I mean, it's just one of those tools that I just could not imagine being a developer without. I love GitHub. I love everything they're doing. So, Oh, and that also happens to be Microsoft. Look at us. We are, uh, we are not close to the idea of sponsorships. So if you'd like to sponsor an episode, <laughs> all right, rock and roll. we take we take donuts, running shoes. All <laughs> so everyone, thank you for joining. We do 
try to keep these two one hour shows. Uh, clearly there's lots of questions and we have a lot of things that we want to deliver to you. We want to get you to that next step. So thanks for joining today. Hopefully we'll see you next week at the same time. And yeah, bring your questions. Feel free to leave your questions uh, in the chat right now. Um, we will take notes and yeah, we will be back. I think next week what we're going to do is we're just going to go from start to finish. We're going to show what an application connected to a managed service might look like, uh, show all those benefits that you might get the uh, the discovery, the integrated configuration. We want to show you those things uh, as an example, some of the things that you might be looking forward to or expecting from whatever platform you're going to land on in production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, again, I think I saw like, Dan, if you take an approach of a hello world for various cloud situations, yeah, that's really what we're going to work on. So we'll take a lot of this feedback, see if we can't put all this together and join us next week. Again, this will be next Tuesday at... Uh, 3 30 3 30 eastern i saw a comment too i wasn't aware of these live videos we will try and do a better job of getting the word out again we are getting more consistent with these so every tuesday join us here check out the tanzu developer center um, check out the spring office hours page to find out what's coming next and go ahead and take a look at past episodes uh, and with that thanks again for everyone for joining us we hope you have a good weekend and we will see you next week